let's get going into this. Um, and I know Ryan is, is going to be helping me lead. And once again, if you have any thoughts or questions or comments or shares, please let us know. Um, I guess, you know, today was, of course, the protest march in, in West Hollywood, and it was written on the street. We've seen all Black Lives Matter. I want to know uh, for everyone here, and, if, and our special guest, please, uh, I want to hear from you, but if you're joining us, let us know in the comments what all Black Lives Matter means, uh, because as it relates to pride, I think we're finally seeing that we're talking about everyone, and that includes uh, trans individuals and the LGBTQ plus community that's been needing to be part of this conversation. Uh, Ryan, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I think all Black Lives Matter is one, a powerful statement, um, finally including queer, trans, and non-binary folks. Um, so many times we, oftentimes, queer and trans people are always involved in cases of screaming Black Lives name, saying their name, keeping their name alive. We're a part of the movement because first, we are Black first, but second, you know, our intersectional identity is very important to who we are. And I think with conversations happening and what we're seeing in this change in history, um, I think a lot of queer and trans folks were starting to realize, well, what about queer and trans folks? What about black and brown people, black people specifically? Um, and it didn't feel like they were a part of the conversation. It didn't feel like when we were seeing trans people get killed, it did not seem like the same energy was kept for them. And oftentimes we would see from cis het black folks saying, this isn't y'all's time. Why are you attaching yourself to this movement? And it really felt like for me specifically, um, as a black queer person, it felt like, okay, so are you just completely erasing me from blackness? Because if you can't accept my queerness and you can't, you can say that, oh, that doesn't matter right now. We need to be uplifting George Floyd's voice. It's just like, okay, I will do that. But also when my trans sisters and trans brothers are out here getting murdered, where's that same energy for them? And so I think with saying all lives, like all Black Lives Matter is really saying, guess what? Everyone is included in that, that is Black. Everyone. Because I think at this point, I, enough is enough. And it, it sucks to see so many conversations, especially in our, your own community, that being gay and Black, where people are just not getting it. And I really don't understand what's hard to get. And so I'm happy that we're having this conversation and I'm happy that this is, is creating this moment of inclusion um, because for far too long, I feel like queer and trans voices were not heard. And I think that's an issue. So, so I guess, I, I, can, I, can I jump in, Cher? I don't know if I can jump yeah, in. Yeah, and then Blair, I know, wanted to say something, yeah. Blair, you go first. I, I can't see all one. Blair, you go that's first. That's fine. Oh, no, okay. I'll, I'll mute myself again. Thank you, I appreciate you for making this space. Um, I think that it's it's multi-layered, right? First, it's from a narrative standpoint, it immediately takes the power away from the All Lives Matter group, which is silent. Like, you know, 100,000 people died of coronavirus, All Lives Matter doesn't exist, it's not a coalition, it's a distraction. Um, and so to say all Black Lives Matter, it is, you know, couching this in really intense and necessary language to say, this is us, this is all of us, because, you know, Black Lives Matter can't even matter unless all lives, all Black Lives Matter, you know, it's that kind of, uh, that level. But going from a historical standpoint, this idea of incrementalism where, oh, if we uplift black patriarchs, then we can uplift ma black matriarchs, then we can, you know, get into LGBTQIA folks. Uh, but if we look at the actual history that we know the people who have been marginalized, uh, especially those within an already marginalized community, we are forced to speak up. We don't get an option. You know, a lot of people this past week or past two weeks just realized racism was an issue, just realized queer antagonism was an issue. If you grow up, experiencing that on a daily basis because you're not gender conforming, because you are perceived to not embody womanhood or manhood or the idea that there's only two options, you have to fight because a system is attacking you. Um, but as far as seeing it written on the sidewalk or seeing it written in, you know, on Hollywood and Highland, it's making a lot of people think that we've reached the finish line instead of understanding that this is just the starting point. So people are starting to tune out because they're seeing this in DC, they're seeing it in LA, um, they're going back to business as usual. 
a lot of folks I, I've seen on their Instagram stories have said, oh, well, look, LA, they, they said it. They said all Black Lives Matter. And it looks beautiful. You know, I love street art next, you know, as much as the next person. But what does it mean for policy change when, like you said, we had two murders of Black trans women and, you know, there's the, not the same energy that we see for Black patriarchs and this idea that we have to put some groups ahead of other groups. Uh, we have to put our best foot forward, but what does it mean if we're all dying? So um, Black Lives Matter, I think at its core, already had the all into it. Black queer women created Black Lives Matter, um, but it's a reaffirmation that, hey, don't get distracted, y'all. Remember that this is all of us. Love that, thank you. Uh, Devon, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in now. So I think, so my thing is that I, I think that, yes, yeah, so part of it, the, the All Black Lives Matter includes Black Lives Matter, but I think that statement's more for the LGBTQI community who's left out Black people, right? So I, I don't want, and this is my own opinion in my experience, the most racism I've ever felt or alienation ever felt was from the white male gay community. So like this, this notion that we're pushing back against this Black Lives Matter movement and like Black people now need to like adjust the language and adjust how we um, state Black Lives Matter. How about the gay rights movement for three decades now has excluded black people. And, and, and gay pride has not have been about inclusive pride. Like until Trump became in office, that's when like white gay men began to like think of other people besides themselves. So like, I, I think that statement in West Hollywood was more about the LGBTQI movement versus Black Lives Matter need to be more inclusive because Black Lives Matter is already inclusive. Black Lives Matter means that all lives matter for sure, but we've been left out, all of us, whether it's gay, straight, queer, trans, et cetera, we've been left out of the all of America, so bring us in. And how to fix that is for white gay men and white men in general to not live in this privileged space where they've been able to ignore us completely. So the, the trans lives matter is not a black people issue, right? It's a white gay, movement a white pride or a gay pride movement that i feel has excluded black people in general and finally because of the political climate we've now been included all black people have been included in this movement and i want to i really i'm concerned about who in the gay rights movement marched when mike brown was murdered like not just right now in 2020 when it's like popular and everyone's making a statement and we're all marching, that's great. But where were you last year or two years ago or three years ago or four years ago or five years ago? I'm calling that out. So I don't wanna get distracted by this thing where like black people have excluded other black people. No, we're all black and we all deal with the same shit in this country. And I need white people, especially white men, gay and straight to step up. That's my, that's my all statement. Right. So Shar has a question that, well, a point that she wants to make. Shar, you can jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, piggyback off of uh, Devon, Devon. I said that right. All, all <laughs> names. So I'm Dev, Devon, Devon, Devon. They're all, the, they're all good. So <laughs> Dev is good. Just start okay. with a D and I'm good. Start with a D and I'm fine. So I do want to kind of reiterate, you know, one of my favorite signs, I, I didn't go protest this morning because I had, I was team typing fast over here. I'm working on some things. But one of my favorite signs that I did see was a play on uh, what Kanye West said during Hurricane Katrina about George Bush when he said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. I saw signs that said, West Hollywood doesn't care about black people. And I wholeheartedly, that was one of my favorite signs because I wholeheartedly agree just to piggyback off of what uh, Dev was just saying. But I do think that uh, the um, amplifying the this cause for black trans lives is as much of a black issue as it is a white issue. I do agree that that white men have repeatedly centered themselves. We see things, at least I saw things growing up all the time, for example, uh, surrounding the gruesome and horrific murder of like Matthew Shepard, right? But there were black trans women who things were happening to as well and no one said anything. Um, despite black and brown trans women kicking off what we know as today, what to be the LGBT uh, rights movement. And so uh, I think it is, it's a call to action for black people as well, because um, a lot of black trans women are dying at the hands of black cis het men. 
And so until we have this kind of like shake up culturally, where people are having hard conversations and people are holding people accountable for the ways in which they uh, contribute to the further oppression of marginalized communities and, and get called out on how even the slightest joke could be an act of violence against a, mar a marginalized community, we're not going to get anywhere. So I think we all, every, every system has to be broken down, every last one of them, and we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So while we're addressing white people and calling them to action about sh uh, showing up for black lives, we can also you know, uh, call cisgender heterosexual and just cisgender in general, right? Because there are plenty of transphobic, cisgender, gay, by lesbian people, but we can also call them to action as well and get them to uh, and, and just examine the ways in which they are being harmful. I love that. Do, do people know, and this sounds like a really crazy question, do, what cisgender is? Because I feel no, just I'd, like- I'd love, I'd love a break. I'm like, happy I, to yeah. clarify. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so cisgender, um, is so you're born you're assigned a gender because we live in a binary society and you grow up and you continue to identify with that designation not necessarily because it's the correct one but because uh that cisgender encompasses when you identify in the same way with how society expects you to behave then trans is when uh kind of a spectrum a lot of folks think that think that trans is a binary transition uh from you know growing up as a boy becoming a woman, um, but trans really is outside of that gender um, binary where it's just the opposite of, cis, not necessarily the opposite, but the other side of cis. So trans being uh, fluidity, trans being the full spectrum of gender exploration. That's why there's trans um, binary people and there's also trans non-binary people. And important things are that you don't have to medically transition or anything to be trans. It's just about uh, your own self understanding of gender and how you perform your gender, and that gets more into gender identity, um, but who you know yourself to be. And then we have to believe those folks. Yeah, and, and I, I encourage everyone, if we're saying things that you don't understand or know, that's what's beautiful of this. We have such a great mix of people here. Like, we want to educate because that's how we get further is for people to understand. Because maybe there's been a lot of people who haven't been in, in um, communities like this or in conversations like this. So that's how we create those bridges. So if you have any questions or you don't understand like what something means, let us know. Uh, oh, I'm you to feel comfortable. Be asking questions. Thank you. Okay, you so good. So I would love to go to Travell. Travell, can you break down the idea of intersectionality and why it's so important for a conversation like this? Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, intersectionality is a, 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 a concept, a term, a, a, a way of identifying things that was first coined by uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. She is a uh, legal scholar, sociologist, all of the things currently at UCLA. Uh, I believe she's still at UCLA. Um, but it's this idea that we move through the world um, as our many different identities at once. Oftentimes when we have conversations about Black LGBTQ people, people love to say, oh, you're Black first. And in reality, no, I'm Black, I'm queer, I'm gender non-conforming, I'm from a single parent household, I'm a military brat, I am, you know, uh, I have a master's degree. I have all the, I'm a journalist, all these things at once. And I bring in all those identities at once because the way that I move through the world, um, the, the way that I experience the world and the way, way the world experience me will be as a result of the intersections of all of those many things. So intersection, intersectionality is this idea where we realize that people have these many identities that all are interacting and interfolding all at once. Um, and it's important for this conversation because I think to go back to the, the earlier question, you know, as we're having these conversations about what, um, what freedom looks like, what liberation looks like, what um, equality and equity looks like, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, while one particular sect of, com of a community may be benefiting, may be doing well, there are always other people that are left out. And so when, for example, we look at the LGBTQ rights movement, um, as Dev mentioned before, before, you know, we were doing a lot of fighting for marriage equality, but marriage equality really only serviced white gay folks to be, you know, more specific. Meanwhile, black and brown, queer and trans folks, you know, are still struggling for health care. They're still struggling for housing. They're still struggling for employment, right? Um, and we see a lot of the institutions that are said to represent the LGBTQ community, um, 
you know, I would say waffling at a moment like this um, because they got their marriage equality and they don't know what to do next. Meanwhile, a lot of these other organizations that are led by black and brown, queer and trans folks are still out here fighting for, um, you know, our equality, our equity, our rights because of that aspect of intersectionality, right? Um, because yes, we may be able to marry our partner of a particular gender, but like we can't get jobs because we can't change, you know, the gender marker or the name on our, you know, identification things, you know? Um, and so that's why intersectionality is an important aspect in, in this particular conversation. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Travell. Um, I know, uh, and I want to bring in at a certain point, Jeremy, from GLAAD because uh, there was big news. I don't know if you, you saw, Friday was a, a sad day. It was the four year anniversary of the Pulse shooting in Orlando. And then Trump reversed Obama era protections that prohibit discrimination in healthcare ba uh, based settings on gender identity. So in, insurance as well. And these were civil rights protections for the transgender community. Uh, so uh, Jeremy, uh, when, when, you see this coming from the GLAD position. I know you're part of entertainment partnerships, so you're not part of the policy making in, in terms of that, but how, how do you as an organization respond to something like this? And what are the internal conversations being had when you see something like this? Uh, that's a big question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, I don't think anyone would disagree that what happened on Friday was completely atrocious. And the fact that it happened on the four year anniversary of Pulse was no coincidence as much as the administration would say that it is. Um, gosh, it was a hard week. I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge how much pain there was this week between that on Friday, um, between losing two more lives, between the stabbing of a, a trans woman in Minnesota. Um, it, it, it was a, a horrible week for our community. And I fear that in, the next couple of weeks, it's only gonna get worse. We're awaiting a Supreme Court decision that could have um, extreme implications for the entire LGBTQ community. Um, and there's a lot of pain right now. Um, you know, glad we're, we're a media organization. We work through the media to make sure, you know, LGBTQ narratives are told correctly and meaningfully. And, you know, that when a transgender woman of color is murdered in this country, they aren't dead named, um, that the story is reported correctly, um, and that their names are, are said and, and held up by the media. Um, you know, I think what we saw, you were talking about marriage equality, and, and I couldn't agree more with everything that has been said so far about, you know, how it was not the end all be all to lift up everybody in our community, and how much more needs to be done. And, um, you know, we are, are very much fighting right now to make sure, you know, housing discrimination, employment, just non-discrimination, um, and socioeconomic equality are the future of the movement. I think for a long time, uh, Devon, you and I talk about this all the time, you know, the LGBTQ movement, so to say, forgot about black and brown people. Um, this is uh, very, very real, and um, it is a high time that the organizations, including my own, do much more to um, make sure the entire community is uplifted. Um, so I've seen a change um, in recent years. I mean, little steps like HRC finally hiring its first black president. It's a baby step, but it's a good first step. Um, the, the changes are starting to happen little by little. And I think as we begin to define our history more, which is something that has been missing for, for many, many years and start to understand all of the history of whatever this queer movement has been. Um, one thing that's given me hope is the positioning of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera as um, the parents of this movement. Um, that's not a conversation I was hearing much about five, 10 years ago, um, but that I'm starting to hear much more now. So, um, I don't know if that answers the question. I don't, I don't know if that comes back around to, to, to you know, how we're pivoting, how we're moving. Um, but for now, we're just trying to make sure stories get told, Black stories get told, and that they get told correctly. Yeah, Blair, and then I'm gonna go to Amber, because Amber's, I wanna hear from you. But Blair, what, you were gonna add something. 
Oh, I was just going to say quickly, like, I think holding both of these truths together, right? There's a lot of, like, LGBTQ folks who are not Black, who are not trans, who then do not learn about the fact that queer, gender nonconforming trans women built the movement. So then you have people saying ahistorical things like, we didn't have these gender things when I was coming up, which is not true, because you wouldn't have had a movement otherwise. Um, then at the same time, you have people who are Black, who are very strong for the movement, who are cisgender, who... Um, you know, conform to expectations of gender, uh, which is, you know, also a, a racial conversation as well, because historically, Black women, cisgender women included, have been denied access to womanhood and then deny access to womanhood for their Black trans sisters. Um, but for folks who, you know, are very Black power, uh, we also need to recognize the fact that without the Black Panther movement, Sylvia Rivera and Marcy P. Johnson were Marxist-Leninists, who were people who were fighting with the Young Lords, who were fighting with the Black Panther Party. So we don't have a conversation about the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement and then have a conversation about LGBTQ rights. This is something that's holistic together. So I think it's really holding both of those truths uh, in tandem, that Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson came out of the Black Power movement and were also leaders in the LGBTQ movement, and we wouldn't have pride without Black trans women. So how dare we let them down? Say that. Mm. Amber, I want to just bring you in this because you are a YouTube star, quote unquote, and um, I want to know how you've used your platform in the past to uh, discuss, you know, these issues and including right now. Hey, everybody. First, I want to say, uh, yeah, sorry, I was I, late. I literally just walked in from the march, um, but uh, and it was a turn up. It was it was a it was a lot of energy. It was good. Um, yeah. First, I want to piggyback off of what Blair said. Hey, Blair, love you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what the other thing that we forget is that when Martin Luther King marched, he marched with his right hand man, who was Bayard Rustin, who was a black gay man. And when they marched, they marched as black people and as gay people. And we forget that sometimes as well, um, even the black community, because I go through this every February, which I was able to get the Bayard Rustin Award a couple years ago from the LGBT um, Center because I have been using my platform on YouTube to speak about these issues. And I've gone through trouble and I, I struggle as a creator still now to this day because of that, because I decided to speak up. Um, I'm not advertiser friendly. I'm not um i'm not you know and so it, it made it so over the years i don't make money on youtube at all no matter how much how much i'm being viewed or how many subscribers i have because i chose to talk about black lives matter and cops killing black people uh, for years and they've they've demonetized those videos they've take they've removed those videos from the platform and it was just crazy that just yesterday um now they have me on a panel on youtube that was live you know, speaking about these things, having me on a panel with the co-founder of Black Lives Matter when, you know, on a platform that has made it so I struggled speaking about those things. It's crazy how that comes full circle. But um, like I, I always just stay positive and feeling like, OK, I like how this feels different. I've been saying this. I've been fighting it. I've been trying to explain also these sides to people for a really long time. And it's caused me to, like, you know, try to find my ways of surviving with my platform or whatever, but um, I feel like this time feels different. So I'm just, um, I'm just thinking positive in the fact that if we keep this movement, become strategic, realize our power, create a list of demands that we will actually create real change. Thank you for that. You know, actually, I kind of want to piggyback off of that about kind of staying positive, right? I would love to know the members of our panel or anyone in this room, are you really are you feeling positive by what we're seeing currently with the protests and the change? Are we feeling like this is a moment that is shifting? Um, are we seeing these things changing? I would love to know from anyone that wants to unmute what their thoughts are. Um, I'll share something. Uh, this is Travel again. Um, I mean, I think I am encouraged by some uh, demonstrations that we see. So uh, today in Brooklyn, um, I live in LA, but 
today in Brooklyn, um, there was a Black trans uh, organized uh, gathering in front of the Brooklyn M Museum. They had everyone wear white. It was led by Black trans films um, primarily. Um, and I think they say like an estimated 20 thousand people came out uh, to, to demonstrate for, for Black trans lives, um, in particular Black trans femme lives. And I think uh, that's something that uh, is amazing to me that um, is new. Um, I don't think we've seen such demonstrations, particularly um, for Black trans lives, um, perhaps ever. Um, and so that gives me some sort of optimism, some sort sort of hope. Um, but, you know, I do also at the same time want to say, um, I think, Shar, you tweeted this earlier, that optimism is a chore. Um, because we've been in similar moments like this uh, before where there was um, energy and there was effort and there were, you know, um, some, some demonstrations of, of moving forward and uh, we've seen ourselves regress. We see, you know, our, our rights and our um, uh, respect being rescinded daily in a variety of different ways, um, all the way up to, you know, the White House. Um, and so it's, we're kind of living in a paradox, I feel, as, as Black um, trans, queer, gender non-conforming folks. Um, and so it's uncertain, I feel. And if I could just add to that, um, I, I definitely agree with what Travel just offered as far as there are pockets of progress, but I know that I was feeling frustrated um, once everything had happened because it seemed like, for lack of a better term, like the perfect storm. It seemed like, you know, the month of May, we were inundated with these stories, these headlines, you know, we, everything from being gaslit from Amy Cooper, who weaponized the police in Central Park, to literally Ahmaud Arbery. Breonna Taylor, Tony McDaid, it was so much that happened in May. And I was feeling just a bit discouraged just as a black trans woman because we see like the trickle down effect, right? We repeatedly see, despite queer women starting the Black Lives Matter movement, we repeatedly see cisgender heterosexual black men centered time and time and time and time again. And so to have a front row seat to witnessing, you know, the threat of Breonna Taylor's hashtag possibly being drowned out, you know, because of everything that was happening, it was like, okay, where, where do we have space in this, you know? And this is, you know, before everything happened, it just was an observation because it seemed like, like Travel was saying, that we had seen some progress, but then once all of these stories ended up, up surfacing, it seemed like there was a huge regression. And then, of course, we saw uh, like Ayanna Dior being publicly mobbed in Minneapolis, the same city that George Floyd was murdered in. And I saw people, cisgender, heterosexual people, kind of cheering that on. So it was optimism is a chore. And it was, uh, it, it, it's been up and down for me personally, right? Where I'm like, yeah, I see it. And then other times I'm like, I have nothing left for y'all. I have no energy left for y'all because it's not being reciprocated. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So good, so good. I, I know that Leo Rising Scott wanted to share something also. I just wanted to affirm uh, what Travell had offered up because while Travell offered up what they said, I returned to recognizing the performative allyship through companies and performative allyship through like fellow coaches and just organizations. And what I would like to offer us a part of the resistance is we have to accept that that's the stage that they're at and that that money, that the intelligent thing is to recognize is the money has always existed. So we were always right. It's always been in budget to be supportive of LGBT plus people, black people, all people. It's always been in the budget. But the thing to consider is that performance right now is a performance it's to hold them to hold them to that standard and hold them accountable for as long as we can. Almost to the point where it's kind of like run, run, run the check, take it and reallocate it because it's a loom. Abundance is a loom. Don't let it be something that, I that we completely turn away from unless we know that it's coming real dirty, real horrible, real wretched. Otherwise, it's like you have to look at the situation and say, "This is a loom, and I'm going to reallocate it until a new version of currency shows up, which we are going to be a part of the ancestries that have the descendants who figure that out." So, but right now it's. Enjoy the painted road. 
make the painted road stay there for four years. It can't go away at, in August. So it's thinking in that way. But y'all keep that fire. This is dope. I I love that so much what you're saying. And I think it's a this is a good conversation to pivot to allyship. Because like you said, we have been seeing a lot of performative allyship. And I know there's a lot of cis hat people, maybe even in this conversation, they're like, where do I where do I belong in this? Where do I show up? Where how what's the messages that do I text someone? I know probably every black person in this chat can relate to getting thousands of text messages from people around them just pouring into them and, and trying to show up. But I would love to know, how are we defining allyship at this point in time? Um, I'm gonna start with Blair. Um, so allyship, a lot of folks are throwing it out the, you know, that word out in the trash because ally, you know, it, it's kind of, when you liken it to war, right? The allies march in when you get attacked. An accomplice is somebody who's there with you from the jump making sure that shit doesn't hit the fan, you know? But it's a language thing. If you feel comfortable with Ally, that's fine, but really start to reframe what that means, right? Like, does it mean that you're only there when shit hits the fan? You're gonna march with us, you're gonna write us a check? Or does it mean that you're incorporating anti-racism and queer affirmation into every facet of what you do to prevent this shit from hitting the fan in the first place? Um, and I think it's something that's really holistic and, I'll, and it ties into why I'm hopeful is because, you know, when the conversations around Black Lives Matter happen, and it's a very tight news cycle where there's, you know, somebody who is murdered by police or by vigilantism, um, they're usually, the way that the response happens is usually because they're a Black, um, you know, traditionally presented man. Um, and then it turns into the image or, you know, footage of that person being murdered goes viral. And then there's a reaction. And then there's people in the streets. And then those people get arrested. And there's a bail fund. And then we forget and then nothing changes and police unions you know lawyer up and protect the cops and those cops if they do get fired get taken to a different area so what an ally does is only there for a snippet of what takes place whereas the people who have to live in those occupied territories occupied by police constantly dealing with brutality um ally means that you you're not really there for the whole time you're just kind of a visitor a witness um and especially in the context of the queer community uh, it's kind of this idea of voyeur, where you're just looking at our pain, but you're not there with us. What I feel <clears throat> hopeful now in this moment is that people are having realizations that feel so basic to me that I'm now realizing they really don't consider these things. And it's not about whether or not you need to be patient with them for me personally. If that works for you, that's fine. But now it's the matter of, okay, like Leo said, we have been correct. There has been the capacity, but there has been an action. And so what do we do forward? Um, and so like what the really amazing thing that I've been trying to stress is that this is an everybody thing, you know, like even if you're somebody who does fit neatly into, you know, kind of this corner of oppression to remember that, you know, like for myself, people are like, oh, Blair, how do you do it? You're black, you're queer, you're Muslim. It's like, I have thin privilege. I have light skin privilege. So that also means that when I start uplifting folks who are different from me, who are, you know, black, trans and non-binary folks, and I, I did a post about this recently, I was gravitating to folks who are the same complexion as me. So I have to do that work. And then I also put those folks last to make sure that I'm affirming the folks who, you know, put folks at the front of the line uh, in terms of, you know, notice and, and visibility who don't get that shine because of colorism, because of white supremacy, and because of the ways that all of these things infiltrate all of us, you know? So it's not just enough to call out the people who are most privileged. It's also calling out yourself. It's this idea of, you know, somebody going to church because they're a sinner too. Not looking at somebody and saying, you're not reading your Bible, you're not coming to church, you're not doing these things, but to say, I also have to work on my own soul, my own self, and then calling folks out laterally that way. Um, and the last thing I'll say is what I really love is that a lot of people aren't asking to be explained. They're not saying, hey, I don't understand what it's like to be a black trans woman, they're moving on from like, well, I need to fully understand this to respect it. And from what I've seen to, I don't care if I understand it, but you should, but I'm gonna you know, fight full force. What we wanna have is both, right? But I think this urgency um, is really uh, interesting, but it's also the longevity of it, the people who are retaining their attention spans. But at the same time, I think that my own peace of mind is to look at the folks who are gonna stay in the corner, not trying to keep them there, but once they get here, what are we gonna do next? Because it's gonna, you can't lead a horse to water. You know what I mean? Thank you so much for that, Blair, seriously. Um, I know Andrew Seeley has something to say. Hi, Andrew. Hello, blessing hey. everyone. Thank you guys so much for honestly coming together to have this conversation because I would say that I have been 
um, deeply moved by this whole entire um, last couple of months. Um, I've been practicing yoga now for 11 years. My first yoga teacher, Rocky Heron, is a gay man um, from Jamaica, really incredible black man and so strong and so incredible in the way that he was able to take me through this practice of yoga and introduce it to me. I, being from Barbados, um, grew up very homosexual and, and, and like in, in the islands, in the islands, it's very, uh, it's very looked down upon to be at all open to even being friends with gay people. And, um, and growing up in, in that space where it was so looked down upon and now being able to be open to be freely myself is incredible. And I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for all of this um, conversation that we're having here. But I wanted to ask a big question because I really enjoyed uh, what you said. I think it was I think it was Ryan who said that you know abundance is um, like you know a, a, we're weaving. We, we have to weave this abundance. We have to really create the magic that is our reality. That most definitely wasn't me. That was oh, the rising. I could never right, formulate those words. Leo rising. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. I'm just going to be honest. I would never steal that shine. I can't even. I lie. The, the other yogi in the building. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, blessings. And um, so I, I really appreciated that um, beautiful metaphor there. And I, I wanted to ask, you know, what are we doing uh, as a community to really bring forth a deeper sense of sharing this abundance so that we can really bring more opportunities back to the community that we wish to serve. Because essentially I feel that right now we're at this, you know, very big pivot point where people are beginning to realize that for this to truly make a lasting impact, we have to truly let go of the old system. We have to let go of the old system and make a new system. And that's the only way that this is really going to move to a place where we can sustainably move forward as a united front of people who realize that we all matter. And that's a, that's a beautiful place to be in. And so what are the solutions that we can now make that are going to really uh, be the catalyst for creating a new system? Because I, I've been looking into cryptocurrency. I've been looking into, you know, a few different ways to build alternative communities um, but it's like, how can we um, make these practices more available to everyone so that we can really band together and make something that is, has a lasting impact? So that's my question to anyone who wants to. Forever. I do want to add really quickly, because okay. I, 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 I love to say this. Everyone has a smartphone or Google. I think researching and doing your part is really important, right? I think we should always have call to actions. And I think it's so wonderful that um, we can have these conversations, but doing the time and, and taking the time and the research and actually applying that and, and looking into certain topics and what we're talking about here, what that means and reading certain books, authors, having conversations with your peers or people that are in the community like this, this is a way to really um, educate yourselves. But I think a lot of times you have to realize that, you, <laughs> you know, as a black person, I have had to go and look up my black history. It wasn't taught to me in schools. Everything was whitewashed. And so I think with any type of history, oh, I do have your book right here, Blair. Um, with anything, if you really want to know more, it's like you have to take that time and that moment to actually research it, educate yourself. Um, but I do think there needs to be some call to actions. And I would love to know from anyone else who has some feelings about this, um, please jump in. I think uh, if I'm interpreting this question correctly, I think honestly it would be better served in a different forum. Um, I don't know if the answers or or the shouldering of that responsibility solely rests in in Black LGBT people's laps. It it, it might better be served. Um, oh, the video changed. Yeah, it's okay. we're spotlighting <laughs> you, Shar. Like, what is happening? Um, it might better be served in those uh, at those uh, cisgender heterosexual tables than ours because we're the ones that are oppressed. And so I feel like that question would be better. Um, better it, it would 
it would be a real challenge in, at the oppressor's table versus ours, if that makes sense. And that's only if I'm interpreting the question correctly. I don't know if that, if we, if that, if that uh, responsibility should be shouldered by us. Can I jump in? I, I just, in the context of the subject around LGBTQIA, um, it's really a white male issue, right? And, and, and I really think that there's been a privilege that white gay men have lived with throughout this gay rights movement, um, trans movement, et cetera, that has allowed them to live in two worlds, right? So it's, it's let's march when it's convenient and it's, it's in vogue and it's a proper thing to do. But I can also go into society that already accepts me as being a privileged white man, right? And, I, and I, so I, I push back a lot right now and I'm, I hold a little bit of like, you know, a side eye towards all the white gay men that are marching right now. I don't, they're marching sincerely or because it's a cool or right thing to do. I don't know if they knew who Martha P. Johnson was before the Netflix video. I don't know if they cared before that. So I, I guess I don't know if this, if this uh, recognition or this acknowledgement is gonna happen until white gay men realize they've had privilege and they've set in that privilege and they set in the necks of people of color that have marched in this movement and we, we, we wanted uh, social change and, and, and justice around LGBTQ um, inclusion. But the truth is that the biggest beneficiary of the LGBTQ movement has been white men. And with that uh, benefit, they then reached back and bring other people of color with them. They, they took off and made sure they were safe in that space. And we can, we can pretend as much as you want to say that LGBTQ community is inclusive, but it's completely exclusionary. It's a white male agenda. And I think it's not on black people to want to be included and be acknowledged. It's for white men that happen to be gay in the context of this conversation to acknowledge their privilege and who they've walked past on their way to the courthouse to get that license to get married three years ago. And until that happens, we can't have an inclusion conversation. It's funny, Deb, because as you call out like white gay men, I reckon like in my same mind, I find myself like talking about feminism and thinking about like white women and their complicity in the systems. So like that, that's interesting to me because like everything you just said, I feel very similarly for folks who, you know, call themselves like I'm a girl boss, you know, I, I have a feminist company. I'm, you know, taking on, you know, capitalism uh, with, you know, a woman's face. I feel very like, you know, disillusioned by that when all the like black people, Latino people, BIPOC folks who are working for those organizations don't even have, you know, maternal leave or contractors, so they don't have health care. Um, but at the same time, like going back to Andrew's question, um, and not to like, you know, directly disagree with anything, but I, I always like consider what it means for the oppressors to define our new reality when they are the ones who made it so shit in the first place, you know? Um, Ooh, and so for that's, me- That's powerful, Blair, though. That, I, that's I get that. Based. Blair, I get that. And, and, I, and I think you're right. And, and I, I didn't mean to like dismiss what you said either. No, no, I, I, think, I think you're right. There's a, like, do we take, we take the reins and do we redefine it in a future for ourselves? But if these systems that are in place prior to that, it doesn't matter what our, our list, or our manifesto, or our, our list of demands are, if there's not an acknowledgement who those who hold the power. And yes, mm -hmm. we can march and we will march and we'll keep marching, we'll keep marching. This isn't the first marching movement, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be real mm -hmm. about that too. Like when the march is done, what has really been changed? And my point is like, I don't want white men to march because it's cool this week. And then 30 days later, they're not they marching. They're back to their jobs and doing their thing. Having brunch with and all white folks. Part of them is having a rainbow on in West Hollywood. Like that's not that's not what this is about. And see, that'll Period. be the true test. In my opinion, that'll be the true test on on the other side of this is what then does this look like? Were you just posting black boxes? Were you, even if you donate it, you know, what, what type of performance art, what type of virtue signaling were you doing? The true test from these companies, from these accomplices slash allies, the true test will be on the other side of this because we've hit a fever pitch in this country right now. Like what we've seen, we've never seen this this before, especially with this many um, non-Black people taking to the streets for Black Lives Matter in particular. Um, no, I, I think this is so important. I mean, for me, we have this conversation, Ryan and Char, you're part of these conversations with us when we yeah. end up on FaceTime sometimes. Um, but I, I feel personally, I feel a responsibility and accountable and I don't, 
I recognize I can't rely on all of you to create the solutions. At the same time, I would love to do it together, but at the same time, I know I can't rely on that. Is that, does that make sense? Well, Shira, it's funny because um, right now I'm in this position with my school board uh, or like a local school board. I went to this school, it was very racist, San Marino High School, um, and I helped the student whistleblowers, you know, kind of name their demands. You know, I happen to be someone who is simultaneously directly affected by the racism and by the bullshit and the queer antagonism and the sexism and the Islamophobia, et cetera. Um, I'm somebody who's directly affected by that. I also have the expertise to be able to solve it. I'm not doing that shit for free. So, like, if the school board does want to approach me, and that's kind of the energy that a lot of the alumni are supporting, the school can't c come to me and say, well, if you want it better because you've raised the problem and it's your issue, fix it yourself. No. First of all, let's talk about all the reasons why we're, we're like one of the few black families in this neighborhood. Going to Redline, talking about, you know, um, you know, racial covenants and leases and how that, you know, changes things. Um, but to not get into my historian head. But, you know, there are some of us who are uniquely equipped to fix this shit. I've said, I will hold your hand. If you're a racist white person or non-black person of color and you want to heal and you want to change your ways and you want to do the anti-racism work, but you're afraid to go it alone, I will walk you through it. You can video chat every day at 8 a.m. I hate waking up early, but you will pay me ridiculous amounts of money to make that happen, period. Because if you were trying to do something else, like you're trying to lose a ridiculous amount of weight so you could fit into your Oscar dress, you would pay a personal trainer to do that shit, which is not healthy. You, you should love the size you are and just get a bigger dress. But what I was saying is that I'm not going to do this work for free and nobody should. And the fact that a capitalist, you know, white supremacist society says that black women should work for free that's the whole reason why we're in the first place, why we're here in the first place, because of enslavement. So we can't just have a new form of enslavement that calls on people of color uh, and black people in particular and black trans people and um, the rest of the, the rainbow alphabet to fix things when we didn't make it this way in the first place, uh, because we do have solutions, but they're not free. And it's not, you know, when I say that, I, I can also, I could just feel the folks who start cr crit criticizing the capitalism aspect they're already commodifying us as a people. They're going to tokenize us regardless. So we might as well get our tokens as they tokenize us and make a better future that I can also afford to live in. And honestly, black people making money is a form of resistance, in my opinion. I think that is, that's the real way to show that we're winning at this point. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, but and does anyone else have anything to add? Because this is wonderful. Blair, you are over there preaching a word on this Sunday. Stop it. Um, I'd like to add something. Um, I think I, I want to start by uh, uplifting something that uh, I first heard um, espoused by Fatima Jamal, who is a fabulous friend and activist, wonderful Black trans uh, artist, all of the things. Um, and I interviewed her, we went to school together, but I interviewed her a few, a number of years ago. And one of the things she talked about was how many of us fail so many of these systems that we are operating under and trying to fit ourselves in. So many of us fail gender and whatever gender is supposed to mean, broadly speaking. So many people fail whiteness and whatever that's supposed to mean. So many black people fail blackness and whatever that's supposed to mean. We fail patriarchy. We fail all of these um, systems that are at play in moving in our particular world to the point where I feel like, you know, to be an ally at this point point in the game at this point in the conversation is um, um, not the most that people could be doing. Um, I think James mentioned in the chat about uh, uh, no more use of allies. We now call them comrades or you just sit on the sidelines at this point. Uh, James's words, not mine. Um, but I wanted to offer up this idea uh, that I hear a lot in activist spaces of moving from being ally to being an accomplice and realizing that you too, as a white person, as a cis person, as a straight person, et cetera, you too are failing all of these systems that some of us fail as well. And you too have something to gain by ensuring that we can live and exist and thrive in this world as well. And so I think oftentimes people, people don't think that they um, are going to gain from these conversations. And so that's why they don't wanna participate. Right. And they think in these moments, oh, I at least can get, you know, a cute little Instagram, you know, of myself standing on the mural 
on Hollywood Boulevard and I'm going to wear my rainbow because it's going to match with the matter part at the end. Or maybe I'll put on pink and blue so I can be on the all part because it's the trans flag color. And they think that that's the way that they can benefit from, you know, being out in the streets and being in these moments. And perhaps that is a way that they're benefiting. But for the rest of us, um, we too have some things that we can benefit from. And I think to, I think it was Andrew's question, um, you know, when it comes to this conversation about like what the future looks like, I think part of that future is about both the building of wealth and the redistribution of the wealth that's currently here. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been, been seeing a lot of uh, black trans activists in particular uplift is this idea of like, you know, you wanna give your money, you wanna, you know, donate to these different causes, but like maybe you should not be donating to HR Maybe you should not be donating to insert white, uh, uh, white white systemic led organization here. Maybe you should be giving to the Okra project project. Maybe you should be giving to the Marsha P. Johnson Institute. Maybe you should be giving to you know Southerners on New Ground, um, people who's who have their feet on the ground right and who who are doing the work who are interested in putting money and putting wealth and putting power and access into the hands of the most marginalized and the most oppressed in our society and you can donate all you want but if 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 we're not thinking about a redistribution of that power and of that wealth then a lot of this kind of you know uh is a non-starter and we don't really we get off and get to talking um what we what we need to talk about and so i just want to offer offer that as like some solutions and ways to to think about this conversation we're having love that thank you thank you so much ben what's up hey i just had a question um of clarification or explanation um i think i understand what everybody is saying about you know allyship not being enough and i think i understand what everybody is saying about um you know, not being handheld for free or how, how Blair put it. And I agree that makes sense. You know, if somebody needs a coach, they should get paid to be a coach. But the question I always wonder and I always ask each week in these conversations so far is like, um, and I understand it's very hard to get like a specific demands list because there's no monolithic one group or one person that speaks for everybody. But at the same time, it feels like when broad statements like that are made, like we're not gonna tell you what it is, we need to, you need to figure it out, that it's kind of along with that comes an acceptance that then it's gonna happen slowly and whatever pace society will slowly evolve, then we'll get that change. Whereas I just wish there was like a specific list of demands that we could then, maybe we have to do the work on our own as white people to help get society there but we know at least what the demands are, like what we need to change, what systems specifically need to change in what way, because otherwise we might want to help as much as we think we should or can, but without to some degree of, of at least being handheld or told what to do, we don't know exactly what to do. And so we'll figure it out slowly because people are stupid and don't change easily and don't know the experience directly of your community and your specific subgroup of your community. If I may offer, uh, Ben, I think that when we say that we're not interested in, in holding your hands or doing uh, that education work, I, it, it, I think I think we have to make a two, it's two separate conversations going on. And I think on the one end, it's, I can't, I, I am not interested in teaching you about how you are putting your foot on my neck. I am not interested in teaching you um, about what how racism is a system and how it manifests itself in a variety of different ways. Those things you can easily Google. In terms of demands, in terms of what the movement is doing, I believe that that information is readily available. Perhaps it's not on the news media, perhaps it's not on your social media feed, and that's where your work to find those people, those on the ground activists who are putting forth that information comes to play. That's where, you know, the conversations around defunding the police and abolishing police, that is a demand. That is something uh, that would seem to be tangible to, to what you're saying. The conversation, uh, uh, 
Blair mentioned the the eight to abolition demands, which you can Google and figure out exactly what that that is. There are a lot of people who are doing the work, who are on the ground activists and organizers who have this information and their their wishes and and what they would like to see. Um, I would say readily available, and it's I don't I don't know if you have an Instagram, I don't know if you have a Twitter um, um, or a Facebook or whatever those things may be. But if you follow those people, um, I think you'll be able you'll realize that that information actually is is there um, and it is present um, and it is um, uh, and it is tangible um, because we're all we're not all just here, you know. Uh, running towards some promised land that is amorphous, that we don't know what it looks like. We know what we're doing. We know what we're going for. We know what freedom looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it tastes like. Um, and that inform I, I do believe that information is out there. I think sometimes when, when people hear us say that we're not interested in educating, it ends up being a, a, a space where folks shut down and they feel as if they can't contribute to this conversation. Um, when in reality, we're just is asking everyone to do the, do their own work um, to bring themselves up to a, a, a certain level where we then can have a conversation where the the burden um, the undue burden is not on us and we I think uh, when we see people or I speak for myself when I see that people have done some work that they're trying um, as opposed to expecting me to hand them the solution for or uh, the uh, some way for them to absolve themselves of their complicity um, in the issues that we're having I find um, myself able to engage with those people differently and it's the folks who haven't tried at minimum and and who want me to do all the work that I'm not able to engage with. Can I add something to that? Oh, um, ben, I, I know we don't really know each other well. Maybe we've met a couple times. I appreciate you co-hosting every week. Um, I think it actually is simple. Um, I, I know a little bit about your world. You, you have a show on Netflix. I just stalked you on Twitter. And um, I'm sure you're represented by one of LA's finer agencies, ICM, CAA, William Morris, Paradigm, pick one. Um, all, all organizations that when, when I walk the halls of CAA are, are nothing but white people. Um, so as a, um, as a privileged white male who has power, um, some of it could be, yes, being involved in some of the activist groups, but some of it could, could be as simple as questioning, you know, uh, management companies in Hollywood, which are, which are full of, you know, white people uh, and, and underrepresented um, in, in great numbers. Um, or even, you know, some of the distribution companies that you work with. It's, I think it starts in your, I guess the, the solution is it starts where you have the most opportunity to create impact. Um, and so I, we're talking about a myriad of things and we have every week. Um, but I think what I'm looking for from my comrades, um, not allies, is that um, you affect and put your thumb on places where you can, where, where your voice is, is heard. When I'm not there with you, going into a meeting, when I'm not there uh, with you in the systems that you travel in, um, where you're going to hear things or have the ability to affect change in a way. Uh, it could be a shoot. You know, you're shooting movies, you're shooting shows, you know, just looking around, because that's what we do as black people. We go, oh, there's only one of us here, or there's only, you know, um, and just to, to walk in our shoes a little bit is this awareness of, wow, CAA is oh so white, or, you know, Grammy is so white, or Oscar is so white. Um, so just kind of understanding that and then being able to apply a little pressure where you have power. But th that's a very helpful answer. Thank you. Both of them have been, but I'm just curious in practicality. So what does it mean? Like I, I'm a low fish on a totem pole, right? And I wish I, you know, I'm barely represented by one of those agencies for one of the 10 things I do and the rest, they don't acknowledge me and I don't get let in the building when I go to have lunch with my agent once a year when he pretends to whatever. So not talking about me, but the point literally is like, I'll, I'll meet you downstairs. So what am I supposed to say to him is like, by the way, the people I saw by the elevator, mostly white. Have you guys thought about letting more people of color into your mailroom program? Just having the conversation, mentioning it whenever possible, because I don't have any clout in these things. Yeah, not to, and not to, I, I'm, I'm like Blair Imani. I'll do the 8 a.m. call with you tomorrow morning. I'll, I'll spend the time. I'll be there for you. I don't want to dominate this whole call on, on you know, tactical things. Yeah. Um, but it's the, the principle. It's the idea, right, that, that you have power. It's the idea that 
you have more power than you believe you do. And I wanted to get to know you anyway. And so I was just telling Shira that we should spend some time. Well, so yeah, yeah I'd love to talk to you about that. Sure. I do think that's important though, because a lot of the conversations that I've been having with the white people around me have been, they are, they don't know how to have those conversations with their friends, their relatives, there are even in their, their work areas that they are having. And so it's, it seems like to them, they don't understand the language that they're supposed to use or what, what are they supposed to say in that moment? Um, Honestly, I'm just a full on blunt person. I just feel like, why not just say it? What do you really have to lose? Because at the end of the day, you're, it's not like anything's really going to impact you. You may lose like one deal, but you'll be able to scoop one right back up because that one meeting that you do have at one of those top agencies, is at least you have it. Because what you said immediately was, well, should I say more, you know, black people should be a part of the mail rooms? That's where we have to start, unfortunately. You get to actually go mm -hmm. into the building and have that conversation. It could oh, be at a crowd. Tony, Tanya, Tanya uh, just raised her hand, is here. Is it Tanya? Is that how you pronounce it? Do you want to do, you have to Tanya. unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. Yeah, thank you, okay. Shira. Um, all fabulous conversations. Thank you very much. And this past week was the first time where I'm always on LinkedIn for my business. I work in marketing, advertising, strategy. And for the first time, I saw true allyship. And by that, I meant where someone would stand up for a person that was racially discriminated and call out that person who was white, sometimes a white woman, someone who may actually be in human resources, call out that person and say, this is wrong, you've been doing it and it needs to stop and everyone needs to know about it. So my question to you is how much weight should we give to that type of social media platform because it is a business uh, centric platform and it does speak to the economics of all of this. I want to just because Blair is about to leave because so typically we end at seven but you know this goes kind of it's like hanging out at dinner and, and Char needs to leave. Oh, yeah, just, a couple people have. I, a couple people. Um, I want to get to the answer. Does anyone as we have the, the few people that definitely do need to leave at seven and if you can stay we appreciate you. Uh, do you want to just leave with some final calls to action? Anything you want to share as you leave? I know Blair and Shar. Um, and then we'll get to your answer, Tanya. Yeah, really quickly before I leave, um, I just kind of want to reiterate how uh, I feel like these conversations are necessary. And these conversations need, the same conversations that we're having in this group need to be then amplified out in the world. Yeah. You know, you need to have these conversations around the Thanksgiving table. You need to have these conversations in the beauty shop, in the barber shop, um, and, and, and call things out. Call transphobia out when you see it. Call racism out when you see it. Because even the slightest little, what may be viewed as a menial joke to you, could in turn be uh, an act of violence. And none of us are free until all of us are. And we have to dismantle this entire system because what we have, what, what we've been doing just is not working. And so that would be my charge to everyone in this group. You have some of the information based on, on this conversation and call it out when you see it and, and be willing to have those conversations. You know, it's not, they're not always gonna be comfortable and that's okay. You know, they're not designed to be comfortable but we, we gotta call it out collectively. Thank you, Shar, for that. We appreciate you. Thanks Thank always for being you. here and being part of our co-host committee, our host committee. Before too many people leave, I just wanted to yeah. chime in and, and sing Travel's praises for a moment. Uh, hi, Travel. Um, I, I work in Hollywood. I work in entertainment. That's the work I do at GLAAD. And it's very rare that we have projects that, that come out that are as important as one coming out this Friday, which is a documentary coming out on Netflix called Disclosure, Trans Lies on yes. Screen that Travel is a part of, um, it is mm. one of, I, I, I have no, no skin in the game on this documentary besides how important I think it is. And it's made by an amazing trans director named Sam Feeder, who um, co-executive produced it along with Laverne Cox. And again, Travel is in it and a part of this incredible documentary and everyone needs to see it when it comes out on Friday and watch it and spread the word about it because um, I don't think there's really much out there that speaks to, 
representation of the trans experience like this documentary is. And probably the most incredible thing amongst many incredible things in this documentary is that everyone that worked on it above and below, below the line that they hired was trans. And when they couldn't find someone trans to do the job, they trained somebody to do the job. Um, and that's important. And that's, I think, also speaks very much to the heart of the conversation we're having, which is, um, you know, oh, you can't, you know, find someone who's a person of color or who's trans to do this job or that job or to be CEO of this Hollywood studio, create the pathway and, and, and make, make them ready for that or just put them there. <laughs> um, so I love that Jeremy is Blair here before. I think she jumped out, but before she left. All right. Well, I'm just going to put a link to disclosure. In yeah, the chat. put it in. And also I sent a follow-up email for all these um, town halls, as I like to say. Uh, so I'll put a also a recap of all these uh, resources for everyone as well. Um, does anyone want to answer on the um, LinkedIn type thing? Like, do you think LinkedIn will be used in that way? Or do you think we're going to see more public, like calling out like Anna Wintour was called out? You know, there was a lot of gossip that she was going to step down even. Do you think we're going to see that happening more and more? Um, I, I think that there, <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, and I think uh, in terms of the, the part of the question about uh, LinkedIn as a potential <laughs> tool, I think it's important for us to use whatever tools that we have at our disposal um, to, if, if LinkedIn is your platform and you know, like, I mean, I don't keep my LinkedIn updated, so that's not going to be good for me. But if it's your platform and you feel um, able to call out or speak about um uh, racism, white supremacy, et cetera, ha how it shows up in a corporate context. I think you should do that. I think you should be, be willing to do that. And I think it will also show you which other companies, which other people are interested in having that conversation as well so that you know who your, al who your allies, who your accomplices, who your comrades are in those particular conversations and, and in those spaces. And in terms of the, the broader calling out, um, I feel like there's a reckoning happening in almost every industry at this point where a lot of people are sharing, you know, some really horrible stories about things that they've experienced and went through, whether it's in media, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in food um and so i hope that it all continues but you know it's too soon to tell like we're still in the thick of it i think it's uh, really important to like uh, do your part to add in like if you feel like you've um experienced something on the platform i think that you should definitely reach out to them and let them know um and then like i said if you see a movement happening you know, jump in on that because I'm sure that it's been a talk. Um, I just want to speak up on YouTube. When I saw YouTube post, um, YouTube on Instagram post the YouTube Black. So they created YouTube Black years ago because Black creators that helped them build the platform after a while, especially catering to the advertisers became, um, we became, you know, we were, Black people, gay people, and people that were not represented on traditional media is what built YouTube. And then after over years, they started catering to the Disney-like characters because that's what catered to their advertisers. So over the years, we just kind of got cast aside. They created YouTube Black to even the field, and they created um, YouTube Latina and um, Pride YouTube. I'm on the board for Pride and also um, Black creators. So when YouTube Black decided and even though they've created YouTube Black, I've still had issues with them on bringing my channel back to where it was, where I can actually survive, right? So it's still a battle because they're like, I love you, but can't give you money, but I love you. And it just is, it just never feels good. So then after YouTube Black posted, I mean, YouTube posted the YouTube Black logo last, uh, last week and said, hey, we're going to donate a certain amount of money for, to fight social justice. I reached out and I said, okay, cool. That sounds good. But where exactly is the money going? Because, I, because they, these corporations have done that in the past. And I've been a part of a lot of pride campaigns and, you know, um, and the boosting of black voice campaigns. But then where's the money actually going? Let me actually see it. So I've been now, I've been that, you, uh, that influencer now that is like, okay, every time that I'm able to be a part of something, I'm going to ask the questions I know nobody else is asking. So I asked YouTube, I hit them up directly. And I was like, okay, where's this money going? And I think that they realize, oh, sh we can't just, we gotta, we gotta walk our talk. And then within the next week, they created this whole, um, you know, panel bringing in all these different voices that they just fumbled and created this week that I was able to be a part of that was 
bigger than anything that I've ever seen before. And now, and then once they started to do that, they realized, okay, I'm going, then they started, they, they moved from $1 million to $100 million to amplify black voices which is huge, right? And now they're actually specific on where they're targeting. So I think it's just us doing the work, us calling them out, uh, us saying, where exa what exactly are you doing? And how, you, how, what, like, how are you, how is this gonna change things? And like literally seeing where their dollar is going. I mean, if you follow influencers, which is kind of what Ben asked earlier, I wanted to say, um, you know, I have had a lot of these forums the last couple of weeks and I've realized a lot of my white YouTube friends are like, oh, how do I find this information? And really their feed is white. They're not, they're not following or subscribing other creators. And then because of that, you're not liking the content. And, and so you're getting suggested other content that fits what your norm is, right? So it's just like, you kind of got to change your own feed in that way to look to, to be more universal, to, to follow more people of color, follow more gay people, follow people that are speaking up. The other thing is I, I try to help people follow a lot of politicians that might, you know, uh, be repping for your ideals. So then you might not even do the work because you're like, oh, I just follow AOC. Oh, okay. Well, I just follow, you know, whatever. And I think somebody asked earlier, I have a video explaining defund the police and I have a video explaining to allies what they can do to help if they don't if they're not out here protesting. So it's really just finding those activists and the, those people that, um, that, you know, that you think could rep, that represents you or just wanting to learn something. So it's, we just gotta do more of that and we gotta call out. So Jackie Aina is one person that's calling out all beauty industries. So it's really, it's just like, people are out there like saying stuff, but just add in, I think just speak up Tanya, Tanya add in your, and say, this is what I'm, I'm experiencing, especially on Twitter. Twitter's gonna be like, oh, girl, we got your back. Okay, cool. And then amplify what you're going through because we're all waiting for people to speak up in the lanes that we need to um, call out and, and, and tell them that they're not doing the work at all or properly. And I what a way to, that entirely. <laughs> and what a way to disrupt like co corporate culture with you know doing it on their platform where they exist, which is LinkedIn disrupting all of that is something that needs to happen so what a way yeah yeah I mean, I mean i i basically have asked you know don't stand on the sidelines in silence and it is about accountability and public transparency in the advertising community across all industries and i even uh acknowledge one ad agency that have actually been one of the first to post their data for equal opportunity corporate, whatever it is, and uh, to share exactly what the breakdown was when it came to their leadership. And they recognize that they have work to do. And so by sharing that information, I'm hoping other agencies will do that too. I mean, yeah, your business too. LA Pride. LA Pride tried to create a march for Black Lives Matter without including any people of color. They, their board yes, is completely is. white. They have one black lesbian that doesn't even do work in the black community at all. So that shows you where they are. And so that's why they got dragged and that's why the march canceled. So I'm hoping that these things of calling them out are actually a step moving forward. So now they can step out look at their board and realize it's all the same people. And now include those voices. You know how long I have been trying to be a part of LA Pride? I live in LA and I host every other single city's pride but the city I live in. That's a problem. And I think that when I talk to um, Ashley, Marie, and like just uh, Shar and I have been on a panel forever. We even like as a black gay panel that received uh, awards from the state legislature because we were speaking about what we go through as black queer people as well as giving the knowledge to our community on how to stay safe sexually. Um, we were the first to tell people about um, PrEP and introducing that and how to get that. There wasn't even, it's like, oh, it became a thing, but then it, it was not a, a thing for queer people of color to be able to access. How do you do that? So just creating, um, and you know, creating a panel where you know people can come and like learn things. So it's really like we got to keep calling them out. So hopefully, I'm hoping like LA Pride can learn and realize that. And that's like it's pretty big. And then I feel like if we get these big, big organizations like LA Pride and uh, like to be checked and now do the work to change it. I just, I just want to add, it's also not just hiring one person for like a diversity role in your organization, right? Like that's the biggest insult. Like, oh, you know what? We got, a, it's like Trump saying, I have my African-American in the audience, right? 
And I feel like this moment, so many corporations, they put the black box up and they did Blackout Tuesday. They're going to do this whole thing and hire this one black person. That's just one person instead of making systemic changes within the organization that have excluded black people systemically, right? So I think, I think the issue is beyond, and, and this conversation is great and what we're doing is great and we're calling things out are great, but it's so far beyond just like one move. The entire infrastructure of the United States is built on racism. And until we acknowledge that this country was built to make white men feel good about themselves and to make them feel, feel informed or affirmed, then it's not gonna matter who you hire this one person in this role. So I think when someone mentioned like dismantling like systems, that's what we need to do. It's like, I don't just look to white men to hire their one black person. I also look for us to create new systems and new ways to spend our dollars, right? So for instance, like Starbucks, like this week was like, oh, you can't wear black modest t-shirts. Well, you know what, then I don't need to go to Starbucks anymore. And I believe, and that means something. So when Dr. King and his movement like boycotted the, the bus system and I think it was Birmingham, it's like, that's dollars mean the most in this country. So we can have this like heartfelt, like, you know, do you love me? Do you see me? Give me a hug. All that's great. The United States of America is founded by greedy white men. And we need to figure out how is wealth distributed in this country. And it's still yes. wealth is distributed equally. That it's not gonna matter any platform, any march, any raising of flags, any, any higher, isn't gonna matter until the systems that built this country are made equal to all of those who live in this country. And as a black person, as a descendant of slaves, we actually built the country for them. So I need to have that recognition and I need my piece of the pie. Because none of this matters, because we care about money in this country. And until the wealth is distributed equally, then it doesn't matter how much we talk about it. Yeah, Tony, I just want to double tap that too. Um, I used to work in your industry and the ad business. I, I built an agency and sold it, it's great. Uh, it's a fun ride, but I think that industry also, uh, we need to put the pressure on how they procure outside talent. So it's not just about the hires, but the vendors they use. Uh, I'm working with a collection of NBA players. I guess I can say it now. It's all out in the open. Um, and we're putting some pressure on teams, right? Like on who they hire for janitorial services or cups or whatever. It's that kind of, uh, to, to double tap uh, Devon's, uh, D, Devon, Devon. Um, Sorry, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's that kind of pressure that, we, that you have the power to affect you being Tanya or you being Ben, or it's the, it's the craft services, right? At the, at the you, know, you meet someone who has a catering business in, in LA or Atlanta. Wow, I really want to use you one day. That'd be great. So then Ben goes in and, and changes the procurement game because he's actually put some pressure because he found a really cool um, Jamaican patty spot that does vegan patties. I'm making this up. But, um, but same thing for you, Tanya. It's, it's like, it's at all levels, I think, in that industry. One that um, needs to learn a lesson or two about how they expand the procurement um, and how they, they go beyond just hiring uh, Bozema and then actually building a system. Exactly, a reckoning. I know that we, I know a lot of people need to leave as we wrap. This always ends up being like two hours because as you can see, there is so much to talk about. It does not end here. So um, good though. So and, good. And, I, and I hope also um, everyone realized the importance of having intersectional conversations and recognizing the intersectionality in this and the LGBTQ plus community in this. And so when you're looking at the news and headlines, think to yourself why maybe they're not covering those stories and how even if you're not seeing it right in your feed, go after it and go follow um, you know, outlets that are covering these stories day to day, even though you haven't seen them in the past, does not mean that's not happening. Does not mean those stories aren't there. Yes. Um, so I hope um, you know this opened up your eyes, educated some of you. I love that some people didn't even maybe know what cisgender was, and like we're creating that bridge for conversation and getting more informed and learning. I, you know, James and I, we had this conversation even as James as a uh, as a black man, like not you know from another older generation. Not to call you out, James, but hopefully you know even him saying, I'm confused even about this conversation. So I think we're seeing it's, it's, it's a white problem, but then also I think like, you know, um, inside the black community from my experience of some of my friends, like there are some straight black people that still don't understand it. So I think together, we really need to work together to have these conversations so we all get it, so we all can be there for each other. So everyone realizes that we care about their lives too in this. That's why all black lives matter. Um, and I know everyone, uh, so we're gonna, 
do a closing meditation. Before we do our closing meditation with the amazing Leo Rising Scott, the full name, um, I just want to give a shout out, do some housekeeping just before we do this amazing meditation to get our intentions going for the week um, outside of this conversation. I just want to, one, give some love to our amazing panelists uh, and my co-host, Ryan Mitchell, who I get to see way too much. <laughs> I know. I'm literally about to see her tomorrow. I am yeah. sick of it. Uh, Shar Giselle, um, Amber Whittington, Amber's Closet, uh, Davon Christopher Johnson, Blair Imani, Travell Anderson, Jeremy Blacklow, um, our uh, host committee who's always here just to promote and amplify and spread the love and be engaged, Ben Glebe, Zinga Blake, uh, Kendra, My Intent, Good Decisions Only, Never Alone Summit, Goddess Process, uh, this is Peace Inside Live, a space that brings you mindfulness, meditation, and movement daily through live Zoom sessions, uh, peaceinside.live for our um, scheduled daily workshops on the weekend and these weekly conversations as well. We started a The Other America, uh, we were on Slack and some people were saying how it just, they connect Slack to work and everything. And so we moved over, even though I'm there in the Slack just in case, but we moved it over to WhatsApp. So uh, we encourage you to go there. I'll put the link right there to connect with each other, share if you have anything you want, uh, any questions anything you want us to share on social media, if there's protests to go to, like we just want it to be a hub for ways to connect with each other, co-create, collaborate, amplify in between these town halls. Um, someone even mentioned a book club. Hey, maybe we'll start a book club. It's, <laughs> we're open to suggestions, but I'm gonna put that um, Other America WhatsApp. It's a bit.ly, which is a shortened URL right there in the chat. So you can all join. Um, and be kept up to date with everything happening. And this is a community we're building as we uh, go. So thank you for your patience and for being part of it. And um, really thank you, Amber. Thank, I want to yeah. also thank Shira and James for allowing me to help moderate the conversation. This was an honor to see so many amazing people and, and just know there are people that are willing to listen and hear what a lot of people have to say because um, it's so important right now, uh, especially at a time like this. Pride is a beautiful moment in history and it feels even more to know that our voices are being amplified. So thank you to Shira and James so much. Love you both. Love you, Ryan. Um, so with that, let's do a beautiful, oh, Amber and Amber. Love, love you, Amber. You lots. I just wanted to say uh, thanks everybody for being here. You, you guys are amazing. I had a good time. Thank you, uh, Shira and Ryan for adding me in this. It was a great. Everybody, just make sure you register to vote and pay attention to every city council, every district attorney. And even if they're people of color, doesn't mean they represent us. That's why we're fighting for Jackie Lacey to go. It's really important for us to pay attention to every single person, the bottom to the top, and especially our presidential candidate. I have a, a I have a series coming out with Jen America about voting. If you guys need information, please keep an eye out. And I love you guys. Stay amazing. Stay proud. Stay woke. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I'll be putting all these links. Everyone's been mentioning amazing uh, resources in this follow-up email. I've been literally uh, adding that as people speak. Okay. Ah, let's breathe. Let's, should we all breathe together right now before we get into this? At a count of three. One, two, three. Through the nose. Ah, and out. Ah. All right. I like it, Shira. Ah, I like that. You can do breath work, is that what you do? I mean, I'll do whatever I can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, start with gratitude as you figure out what your seat is. So if you're laying in your bed, just prop up a little higher. If you're in a chair, make sure the heels are set, the balls of the feet are set, but just get there in gratitude and give your body the opportunity to give you feedback. And the feedback that you wanna listen for is temperature. Pausing, humming, something moving. And then assign a breath that's going to go to the front of the ab abdominal wall. So you think belly button, think towards the knees and just make it really big. <sighs> Hold it. Keep the chest empty. All the air is in the belly. All the air is near the bowels. Near the bowels. And then lift your inner ears if you're a head stop. Lift your inner ears and stack the ribs over the pelvis. And then tilt the jaw up to the sky. Breathe. <sighs> Keep the contraction, remain empty. Call back that fireball and the honest, imagine no one's spirit, no one's higher consciousness actually left, just where they needed to be. They are still with us. 
and sends that sphere to be a specifically textured light on that empty belly. And then when you breathe in, it moves slightly forward towards the center of something. And when you breathe out, it comes to meet you gently near the bowels, near the exit organs, near the sex organs. Breathe forward. Exhale within. Keep that going. A slightly firm lower belly pump. And this fire sphere catching the nearby embers of everyone who showed up today and everyone they met, everyone they hugged and text, I love you, everyone they thought about, everyone they missed, everyone they mourned, everyone they doubted, anyone who they caught eye contact with, any person they scrolled on the Instagram and they don't know. One day when we leave this earth, the attachment of our thumbs, our heels, our feet, our shirt, it won't be there. What will be instead is a deep knowing of what we struggled with and what we overcame. Remember we called in ancestors, influences, the real ones who follow us and we don't always follow them. Feel them pick up your orb and walk it to the center, the center of something. You don't even know, need to know what it is. Feel that texturally and temporally, time, heat, or coolness. Notice the container you've become now that your wisdom, your patterns of resilience, your expression, your depth, your learning, your presence is being shared in the great all is. And the pain of it, some of the pain has gone with to be transmuted But the program left near your heart, the quality of receptivity, the actioning towards peace that includes everyone, that beyond the flesh is sometimes excluded. Rumi says, out beyond the ideas, of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field and I'll meet you there. But until we get there, we have to be present to what is, texturally, sensorily. Assign to your beautiful body this openness to listen, to listen to the new word that we inherited, comrade to listen to your impulse if you are even meant to hold their hand or leave them on this earth for someone else to do it, no one to walk away. Set the intention to offer information with grace and let your higher power, let your experience of love be a shield and a compass. These are sensitive times And now I want you to imagine that fire turns into a swirling pillar and moves upward. And there's a swirling pillar inside of you that moves downward It anchors you to your experience, what you will go off and take from this satsang and contribute to the world. Some places you will seed, some places you will tend to the agriculture, some places you will rip the weeds out of place. 
you have work to do. And take six breaths, experiencing your return to your body backwards. Resting in your marrow and in your bones again at gratitude towards the last two breaths. Bringing your hands up and open or to prayer or something that connects you into touch. And imagine the weight of the upper eyelid is between your palms and blink up. Unity is what we seek. Unity is what we know. But listening is what we must do so that there is strategy that is inclusive, holistic, and purer than what has existed. Not the purest, just purer. Close this experience with any sound that's important to you. It could be ohm, it could be ah, anything. I'm going to close it my way. Ah. Ah. Return to your body, return to your organs. If you want to put your camera back on, seeing people helps return. Elsewise, I just end every experience with I see you. I honor you. I want to know that you're doing well in life. I want you to know that I believe that, that your people should do well in life. And as always, keep rising. Thanks for having me, Shira. Thank you. We are rising. That's such a beautiful for gift. Thanks for sharing yourself tonight and for all of you for joining us and giving us your space, your energy. Um, once again, I'll be sending an email with everything and links to all our amazing guests. We appreciate you. Uh, we will continue the conversation on WhatsApp. And of course, next Sunday, if you have any feedback or thoughts, please let us know. We're here together. Many blessings. Have a beautiful end of your weekend and beginning to your week. Thank you. Bye.